My name is Dr. Lance Nielsen, Supervisor of Music for Lincoln Public Schools. On April 18th, Lincoln East High School hosted the NSAA District Music Contest. This is an event where our high school band, choir, and orchestras come to perform and are adjudicated by three judges. Although it's called a contest, it really is a festival event where the music judges listen, provide both taped and written comments to each ensemble with a point score and overall rating on how well they do in their performance. Essentially, this is our NISA test in the music department. The only difference is that the students learn and are assessed individually in their music classrooms on the knowledge and skills of music. Then the students must work together collaboratively in an ensemble setting to produce the beautiful music you hear from the stage. What a great example of how to apply learning in a real life setting. We could not be more proud of the music students and their teachers of Lincoln Public Schools for their great work. So we're going to share with you some of those performances from April 18th. Good evening. I would like to welcome you to this meeting of the Lincoln Public Schools Board of Education for April 26th. Call it to order. Laura, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer? Here. Mr. Boswell? Present. Mrs. Danick? Here. Mrs. Duncan? Here. Mr. Mayhew? Present. Ms. Mumbacard? Here. Mr. Schulte? Mr. Schulte is excused this evening. And the Open Meetings Act is posted between the doors on the wall for those who, it's according to law, and for those who want to take time to read it. Tonight we have a public hearing. Public hearing is it's the uh, annual public hearing on Lincoln Public School Student Fees Policy 5520. Before we begin the hearing, I would like to note that staff has recommended changes to only Appendix 1 of the current policy. I would first ask staff to give a brief report on the amount of money collected for the use of waivers for the prior year. I would be staff. 
Little, that would be Dr. Um, Stavum, by the what? way. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a, an amount that varies from year to year, depending on our student population, of course. And so I'll go back just a couple of years. 13, 14, the amount expended was $193,282.05. The amount expended in 14, uh, 13, 14 was $129,400. $129,437.93. And this year to date, we're at right about $169,000. Thank you, Dr. Stavum. For those interested in speaking during the public hearing, the same guidelines apply as public comment. Speakers should complete the blue contact card and present it to staff prior to speaking. Speakers have a maximum of five minutes to speak. The board does not engage in conversation with the speakers, but listens carefully to the comments as part of its collection of information for consideration of agenda items. With that, I hereby open this public hearing before the Board of Education of Lincoln Public Schools. This hearing is being conducted under the provisions of the Nebraska Public Elementary and Secondary Student Fee Authorization Act and other Nebraska laws. The purpose of this hearing is to receive input regarding those the proposed policy 5520. The input received in this hearing will be taken into consideration by the board when we take action on proposed policy 5520. Would the first person wishing to speak please come forward now. Seeing no one. Uh, I hereby close this public hearing. This concludes this evening public hearing on Lincoln Public Schools Student Fees Policy 5520. And now moving on, you have before you minutes of the last board meeting. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, we'll move on to special reports, presentations, and celebrations of success. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing a brand new regular segment on our Board of Education agenda. On the second meeting of each month, we will feature something called a student celebration, highlighting the, our Lincoln Public Schools students and the wide breadth of their classroom assignments, activities, and achievements. Tonight, we welcome Jennifer Thomas, a teacher at McPhee Elementary School, and several of her second grade students. They are here to describe their delightful animal research projects and read to our board members. Welcome Mrs. Thomas and McFeed students. And would you introduce the students as well, please? Yeah, do you want me to go ahead and introduce them now or they'll introduce themselves? We can probably do both. Okay. Um, well, tonight I have Saley Dar and Mohammed and Michaela joining me. And then we also from McPhee have Callie Keller and uh, Betsy Gomez. Thank you. All right. And first, we, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share one of the many great things going on at McPhee Elementary School. During third quarter, second grade students do animal research during writer's workshop. Students picked an animal from a selection of pre-picked books found in our school media center. Together, we learned about note taking. Students were given time to take notes by answering one research question a day. Students also used the website PebbleGo to find additional facts about their animal. When research was completed, we followed the writing process through writing paragraphs, editing, and then publishing. We completed our research projects by creating covers using the program Comic Life, making hand drawings of the animal, filling out a diagram, as well as creating animal poetry. After completing the research project, myself and the other second grade teachers at McPhee wanted to give our second grade students the opportunity to show off their hard work. We created a Google Doc and shared it with McPhee staff, asking if they would like to listen to our students' research projects. Those staff that wanted to help us out filled out the Google Doc, and we assigned students a staff member to read to on a certain day and time. The other second grade teachers and I were ecstatic with the results of these projects. We loved the support we received from staff. McPhee is a great community full of teachers who want to support the students and staff in all we do. Our teamwork gives students experiences that will foster their love of learning. My name is Michaela. My animal was the Arctic Fox. My favorite 
part of the research was making the My Animal Fact poem. I will read to you my animal fact poem. I am an Arctic fox. Come see my home. I live in the Arctic and the tundra. It, and it's a place where trees don't grow. Look at my furry fur. I'm white in winter, but brown in summer. Check out my awesome sharp claws and teeth. See my beautiful fur and tail. Listen and you will hear me howl in the air. I can do amazing things. Would you believe that I can eat dead animals? Watch me sleep in my tail. I can also dig dens. Enemies, I have a few. I watch out for polar bears, wolf packs, and humans. They are bad news for me. I am an Arctic fox. You all have to agree there's no animal quite like me. My name is Mohammed. My animal was the muskrat. My favorite part of the research report was making the cover on the computer. I will read to you about, how, about what muskrats look like. Let me tell you about how a muskrat look, looks like. It has large front teeth, a long tail, and sure, short brown fur, also webbed back feet, and sharp claws. It is a rodent. My name is Sele Dor. My animal was sea stars. My favorite part of the research was making the diagram. I will read to you some interesting facts I found about sea stars. Let me tell you what sea stars eat. They eat clams and oysters. Sea stars push its stomach out of its mouth. If it is drunk enough, the stomach juices break down their food. Thank you, McPhee students and Mrs. Thomas. Thank you, Mohammed. Mrs. Danik, Mohammed would like to take my seat for the rest of the evening. <laughs> We'll gladly let him. <laughs> All right. Moving on on the agenda, uh, we have a student celebrate, or excuse me, LPS wellness update from Dr. B uh, Bob Browner. And would you introduce who's with you? Yes. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share our annual LPS wellness report. Um, to begin the presentation is Dr. Bob Browner. He's an award-winning executive director for Partnership for Healthy Lincoln, an organization with which, with which we've had several very successful partnerships. Partnered with him right now is Dr. Matt Avey, who's our curriculum specialist for physical education and health. He'll talk about some of the practices that Dr. Rauner is looking at community-wide, how they impact our curriculum, help our students and staff uh, be healthy and um, better prepared for, for learning, better prepared for life. Following uh, Dr. Avey will be several other presenters and they will introduce themselves. So, Dr. Rauner. You should have uh, two, two things with you. One is the report that goes out to the community this week, essentially. And then within there should be one that has kind of further numbers for those who want the more raw numbers. They might be tucked inside. Um, so this, is, this basically is a report we've been doing annually. We're in our eighth year of the program with uh, Lincoln Public Schools. Um, goals is to improve the health and wellness of the schools, uh, the students, and also the staff. Uh, we're going to start off uh, with fitness, uh, partly because it's the one that's most associated with academic achievement. The, uh, this is, we redid the data again this last year on the kids who passed the fitness gram pacer and how they do on math, reading, and science scores. Um, we've set a long-term target for f improving fitness in the schools. Our goal is to hit 80% by 2018, or 2020. Uh, this is our annual results. We were a little nervous last year in that we had such a big jump, we were worried it might be a fluke, uh, but actually we've uh, maintained that and even got a little bit better. 
Um, if you look uh, in more detail, the numbers here, uh, the biggest improvement, especially as in middle schools, is very dramatic. Uh, unique to Lincoln Public Schools is that actually as the kids age and grade, they actually get more physically fit, which is contrary to most national trends, which show a pretty dramatic drip drop off, unfortunately. Uh, the only downside is that uh, elementary school progress hasn't been quite as big, and I think mainly it's just basically due to the, the activity time. It's a little harder. They have a little more time in the middle school environment. And then Matt's going to talk a little bit about what's going on. Sure. Um, as Bob said, the emphasis in the past few years has been on trying to develop uh, fitness uh, for more reasons than, than strictly um, academic, although that's a nice uh, tie in to our academic programs as well. Primarily, the last few years, uh, especially in our elementary schools, they've been really focusing on what we call MVPA, which is moderate to vigorous physical activity, and not only emphasizing that, but identifying to kids what that looks like in the gym. Um, that doesn't mean that we are taking away any of the knowledge or the skills um, that we're building in that, in that gymnasium, but what we're trying to do uh, is really develop that efficacy piece so that the students can enjoy a lifetime um, of physical activity. Um, in addition to that, uh, because they've been doing it the last few years, it's, it's nice to see that now um, on a national level, national guidelines and new national standards are calling for uh, at least 50% or more of the lesson um, or the content time to be, uh, for students to be engaged in what we call moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, and so measuring that is something that our teachers are, are doing their best to do and also squeezing as much time as we possibly can out of those individual lessons um, in the gym. <coughs> Finally, uh, one thing that our teachers are just now kind of figuring out is that this data that we've been collecting through assessment and Dr. Rauner, um, Rob McIntyre has also helped a bunch with um, the ESU and the assessment office on collecting this data, but also um, allowing us to utilize the data because data is uh, essentially worthless without um, some interpretation and some uh, ability to to move forward um, and goal set with it. So now, finally, our teachers are, are able to see the power of that data um, in terms of goal setting, um, establishing uh, SMART goals during PLCs, and um, seeing a little bit about uh, individually where their schools are at in terms of overall fitness. Okay. And then uh, we're still monitoring weight status too. Uh, so there's a, a bigger report here. We're not collecting in all nine grades this year, mainly because of nurse time. It took up a lot of time and we didn't felt we need the whole nine grades to be tracked. The good news is that the overall trend is still down. So we've continued now six straight years of what looks to be lowering uh, obesity rates and improving healthy weight rates. Um, the other thing that is new this year, in the past we'd seen that within the school environment our, weight, our healthy weight was getting better, but kids were still showing up to school the same uh, level of, levels of unhealthy weight, kind of like some of other academic measures. This year for the first year, our kindergarten and first graders are both, both below 12% obese, and we think that it might be some evidence that some of our uh, stuff is leaving the school and going home to the families. Uh, that's been a, pro, uh, a focus of our, of our community-wide efforts, and then also Michelle has been doing a lot of challenges, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about some of those. Yeah. And, you know, it's the best problem in the world that as the wellness facilitator for the district to have so many people we need to fit in to talk that I don't have a lot of time to talk about wellness tonight because I think that's just wonderful that we have so many partners. But um, you are, uh, you receive as board members weekly messages from me. So you kind of keep up to what's going on if you're, if you're checking out what crazy things I'm telling you about all the great things that are happening in our schools. And we just have more stories to share than I could ever have time for. But what I really feel is a big piece of us moving this forward is really getting everyone on the same page and utilizing the wellness challenges to get there. We have on average around 7,000 kids that complete most wellness challenges. Some of them are up to 9,000 uh, kids that return their results. We know a lot of results don't come back. But the kids that are actually turning in the results, and I'll get back 12 pages of responses of how things have changed for them. And it's really amazing to see, see the impact of what's happening for kids. The nice thing we've also had is a real opportunity through our collaborations to do some nationwide sharing. And we're seeing what we're doing here in Lincoln being um, shared nationally in a really positive way. Um, we have resources in our community that are amazing. Uh, we could not do what we're doing without the partnerships with Field to Play 60. They provide, uh, this year they provide us about $49,000. Ed and Mary Koppel have been very generous to our LPS Foundation Fund that supports us another $50,000. And now we're at an endowment place with the Bayer Playground Fund, which will provide another about $10,000 a year to keep supporting what's happening for us. 
And then um, just another little highlight, last year, um, I work in partnership with about everyone in the building, but I partnered up with um, James Blake and um, with Brittany Albon and Scott Wieskamp, and really we uh, applied for the district um, national level for the, uh, the Department of Education Award. And this year, we wanted to take it to a school level with two schools already, and Prescott Elementary and Irving um, are receiving the Green Ribbon uh, designation this year in Washington, D.C. So we're very uh, proud of their hard work, and we just really had to look at you know, what schools are there with environmental wellness, are there with science curriculum, and are there with uh, generalized wellness. And uh, we have many, many examples, but these are our first two individual schools that we're recognizing. Okay. Good evening. My name is Edith Selmwalt, and I'm the Director of Nutrition <laughs> Services. Um, this school year, we've been working to encourage students to eat healthy school meals with a smarter lunchroom concept that nudges kids towards nutritious foods. It applies research-based principles from Cornell University that leads children to make healthy choices. We have done plate waste studies to measure if we can increase the consumption of vegetables with changes we make. We serve fruits and vegetables now in a black square container that students perceive as fancy. We see fresh fruit in colorful bowls and baskets. We decorate the serving line area so it's attractive, inviting environment. We label foods with fun names like Pump Me Up Pineapple. We use posters and signs to encourage students to eat vegetables. Farm to school, we have sourced local foods in Nebraska from Ord, from Tecumseh, from DeWitt, North Bend, and O'Neill. We are teaching students about how and where their food is grown. We are one of 74 school districts in the nation to receive a $45,000 farm to school grant. And the last thing we want to talk about is that the data isn't just useful for Lincoln Public Schools. There's actually quite a few other nonprofits in town that use the same data. We break it down on ethnicity, for example. So El Centro de las Americas and Malone Center can have ethnicity specific data. Sometimes we'll break it down on the neighborhood level for a cute neighborhood center that it serves several schools. We can give them data on how they're doing and that's used for multiple other grant applications. And so I think it, it's not only helping the school, the, what we break down, but actually just about every health-related nonprofit in town is using this kind of data for their own grant applications to assess their progress. And key to a lot of this is, is, is how that's collected. And we really want to thank Marge Thiel and her staff because they really do provide what creates a lot of uh, benefit for all of us. And so she's going to talk a little bit about that. So I'm the supervisor of health services. And it is the health services staff that collect all of the data. Um, when we do that based on uh, what's mandated by the state along with our other screening guidelines. So it's uh, preschool through um, fourth grade and then seventh grade and tenth grade. And then we also uh, collaborate with the school of nursing in the, in the district. I'm in the city, I mean, in terms of bringing in volunteers and student nurses and training them to participate in gathering that data. So it's most helpful. And then this year, we were very fortunate to be able to receive a gift from Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln of digital scales and stadiometers for schools that, that were needing those. So that was so appreciated. And it really um, even sparked our staff to look at what, what they have in their schools and ordering their new supplies or finding funding so they can get better supplies as well. And so thanks to everybody that's involved. There's a lot of folks that have made this happen. And, and uh, three who started this project who aren't here today that I still want to recognize, Mary Bell Avery and your predecessor, Judy Zabel, that helped start this data eight years ago, uh, and even uh, Richard McGinnis, who was kind of some behind the scenes support a few years back. And so uh, this has grown to be a larger project that's getting hard to squeeze it all in. So, so any uh, questions? Thank all the presenters tonight. And there are many other presenters that could come up. Scott Wieskamp could come up and join and talk about the healthy environments we have. Uh, Russ uh, Ewing could come up and talk about mental health issues and how we help support families in that way with their wellness. Um, it's really comprehensive. And I hope you leave the presentation with, with three things. The comprehensive nature of it, the fact that there's steady improvement every year over any period, year period of time. And finally, that it's recognized. We're recognized nationally year after year for what we do in Lincoln being best practices and making not only a difference for the Lincoln community, but communities around the country and it's through the efforts of our staff and our community that have made that happen. We're happy to answer any questions that we can in the time that we have available. Mr. Mayhew. Uh, I don't have a question, but I wanted to comment uh, that I think there are, there are a lot of really neat headlines uh, in the uh, presentations that we got tonight, a lot of good information. 
One of the things that I have found most compelling uh, in the presentations that uh, we've had uh, in the past uh, are the, is the, uh, the data that's being collected that directly ties increased uh, physical fitness with uh, increased uh, academic achievement. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, it's really neat to have uh, actual data that, that tracks that and shows uh, a direct correlation. Uh, and so I, I just, I think that that's very positive and I appreciate uh, the work and, and the, uh, also the uh, community collaboration, I think is a very uh, neat piece of this as well. Thank you so much to all the LPS staff uh, who are participating in this uh, and to you, Bob, too, for uh, coming and uh, making this presentation. Okay. Thanks. Annie and then Lanny and then Dr. Joel. Um, as a mother of both a high school and a grade schooler, elementary, it's very interesting because pacer is now a common word in our household of I have to do the pacer today. And I have to admit, I've not really quite understood what that meant, except that then afterwards, when you pick them up, it's how well did you do? And they have this way of talking with each other. So that's Ken. Uh, congratulations on that. And the other thing that happened just today as I was bringing home the fifth graders, the fourth graders, and the kindergartners, one of them said, healthy, healthy, healthy. I'm so tired of the hearing them telling us to be healthy. And I just had to crack up because I'm like, well, there you go. It's a, and they had this whole conversation about what it meant to be healthy in the back van. So it went very well timed that I had to be the uh, right home today. And they had a large conversation. So it's just an antidote of that. It is permeating just kind of like how both positive and, you know, I, I said, well, what, what's wrong with the word healthy? And that just took us off. So, um, but thank you for all that work. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, add and build on to my colleagues' comments. I uh, particularly appreciate the ongoing efforts that you've done, that this has been a sustained effort, uh, and that you've used that data to help identify best practices in specific buildings and spread those across the district. It's exactly the way that we want to see data used. And uh, just for a moment, I want to put on my uh, Nebraska Association of School Boards hat and thank you for all your work uh, recognizing the needs of addressing the whole child and uh, the efforts that you've made to help that whole child project. Uh, and then finally, just a quick shout out to Edith. Uh, I had an opportunity to eat with some second graders at Everett Elementary last week, and we had spaghetti and uh, Mexican pizza, and it was absolutely delicious, and uh, the students were just eating it up. So thank you. Dr. Joel? I agree with everything that's been said, but I have a question, Marge. What is a stadiometer? <laughs> <laughs> that's the measuring device that is all in one piece that the child can stand up against uh, to measure their height so we can get a better accuracy than, say, putting a tape measure tape to a wall. Got it. Thank you. So we no longer use the yardstick with the rock on the head. Yeah. Right. Okay. Got it. Connie? I just wanted to thank Dr. Rauner for all of his dedication to our school system and to our students. Boy, I look at all the data you send us through emails, and I'm just amazed. You're working at a national level and a local level, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Annie, do you have? I do. Annie asked for a point of personal privilege, so I told her this would be the best time to do that. Um, um, this weekend, we lost a, um, a friend of LPS um, who also happened to be an extended member of my family, Mr. Richard Dickerl who um, is known to some of you as the Egg Man, and he created in the 70s with the help of the Northeast Kiwanis and the US, UNL's, um, I'm not gonna get straight all of that, who was involved with it, the um, embry em embryology. embryology, thank you. In the other words, the chick program in third grade. Um, and he was Uncle Dick to me. He was a um, related kind of by marriage type of thing. Um, he lived to be 95, and he was a very giant of a man, very kind man. Um, he would drive back and forth to Spencer, Iowa, 500 mile trip three times a year up until he was 90 to bring us the eggs for all of our third graders to go through the program. And if you ask any third grader who's been in third grade since about the 80s, what's the coolest thing about third grade? And they will tell you the chicks. And um, even today, um, my niece was coming in. She showed the picture. And one of her friends at Lincoln High said, oh, it's the chick man. Um, so it's very, um, so I just would like to honor him and that what I really think is amazing is that he's just a man who really believed passionately in that he, I asked him once why he did it, why he worked so hard to bring the eggs, and he says, I just think it's great kids want to learn and they need to know these things. And so he was doing his part to helping kids learn and know things. And I just kind of put it in that pile of things that like the best ideas come from 
parents and the adults in the community who want our kids just to know things. And um, he will be remembered, his, he has no, I think he had an idea of how long, but it will carry on for many, many years that um, the work that Mr. Earl did. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Now it's the time in the agenda for public comment. Uh, members of the community who wish to address the board can come forward. And a time limit of five minutes will be allotted for any speaker. Members of the Board of Education will not respond or engage with speakers. Persons speaking to the board during public comment may hand out printed material to the board, but may not use any other form of media. The board chair may make adjustments to the public comment guidelines according to policy 8420. If at any time persons appearing before the board exceed the time limitations or become abusive in language or behavior, the chair may declare that person out of order and refuse per permission to continue to address the board. Anyone refusing to be identified will be prohibited from speaking. And after that warm and wonderful invitation now, <laughs> Mr. Lee Todd is asked to address the board. Mr. Todd, would you please come forward and when you begin speaking, you will have five minutes. Uh, I guess I know the routine. Uh, my name is Lee Todd. I have two children at Beatty Elementary, and I'm here to discuss the second reading of um, proposed policy changes to 6450. And again, I would humbly ask the school board to, con to consider exactly what you're doing with this policy. We either believe that parents are the final arbiters of their child's education, or we don't. We don't take half-hearted steps. We either believe that firmly with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and all of our being, but we don't. And to be the arbiter of our child's education, parents need to be empowered, and that's what the definition of an arbiter is, to be empowered to make those decisions. And to be a judge, and that's what the definition of an arbiter is, to judge the facts. But if we have a parental notification policy that does not allow the parents to judge the facts in advance, we don't have a parental notification policy. And if you really honestly ask yourself, and I sent each and every one of you an email, and I broke down the four principal parts of what you're considering to doing to LB, or to, excuse me, policy 6450. If you really look at them with your heart and you analyze them critically, and I want to go through that a little bit this evening, I think you will arrive at the same conclusion that I have. And I'm going to do that now. So again, are parents the final arbiters of their children's education, or are they not? And if they're not, why have a parental notification policy? Why not just do what you want? The first thing that I notice right away and that everybody catches this is that the administration no longer has any responsibility whatsoever. The attempt is they have no responsibility whatsoever ever to notify. That phrase, public schools as an educational institution, with this, what LPS is, have a responsibility to and should inform parents in the event that controversial issues are to be part of the curriculum, is gone. There is no other place in 6450 where the administration has any responsibility to notify except there that I know of. None. What you're doing is you're putting 100% of the blame onto the teachers. 100%. Because notice in the second part of that change, it says no longer says teachers uh, have a responsibility to and should inform the parents. It just simply says teachers should. It doesn't say they must just as they should. The fact that teachers have a responsibility to notify the parents, to me, a responsibility to do something is a must. You must do that. That's gone. And so I ask everybody to look critically at your words. I'm not here to squelch controversial topics. I'm here to say parents have a right to know. And you are about to degrade that right seriously, significantly. And let's look at number three. Uh, the third one, and this is also on the email, and I would respectfully ask a response from each of you. Do these items, uh, but number three, unplanned topics, and I won't go through the whole detail. I don't have time to do that. I only have five minutes. Unplanned topics, essentially what you're saying is anything that comes up, the teacher can talk about. That may be fine, 
but it may also not be fine. There may be parents who are adamantly opposed to what's going to come up. And you know from being, those of you who are attorneys or attorney background, those of you who are qualified educators, you know you can lead that discussion anywhere you want. Those kids at 6, 7, 8, 9, 12, 13 years old are largely defenseless. They are not going to be able to stop the onslaught of anybody who's an adult in that position to be able to stand up for something like that. So, and by the way, how are we going to prove whether it's unplanned or planned? I defy any one of you to go into a classroom and challenge a teacher and say, well, that was planned or that was unplanned. Why not just come out and say, we will notify the parents? Why not? And the fourth one, adding the words far enough in advance, um, teachers must or should notify far enough in advance, the words far enough in advance. One okay, minute. thank you. Uh, okay. But the current policy implies that. If you're going to notify someone, then you have to notify anyway in advance. I look at that as a neutral change. But the first three areas that I've talked about tonight, every single one weakens the policy. And some of you I've talked to personally, and you say it's good policy. Well, I would ask the council who's advising LPS, it's probably very good policy. From an attorney standpoint, it's great for LPS. What is it for the parents, and who are you representing tonight? Are you representing LPS? Are you representing the parents? And so in conclusion, I would just like to say, and ask again the question, are parents the final arbiters of their children's education? And I would encourage you to really go back and look at this. I was probably the first one to start the whole process. I've, nobody said anything to me about this. And two weeks ago, That's everybody was high-fiving and saying, well, it's great. You know, We went around and talked to people in the administration. But if you really want to hear an open dialogue, I would be willing to have it and, and bring some people in who have a different viewpoint, perhaps. So please consider carefully my Your five words. Minutes. Thank you, Kathy, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. We have a second person who's asked to address the board tonight. It's Mr. Stephen Griffith. Mrs. Begin speaking, you'll have five minutes. All right. Mrs. Danick and members of the board and Dr. Joel, my name is Stephen Griffith. Uh, I am uh, a parent um, of one who went through uh, public schools in Omaha um, quite some years ago. And um, um, I also am a product of public schools in other towns in Nebraska. And uh, I also am a retired minister. Over the years, I have had the privilege of knowing many public school teachers and administrators and um, knowing them not only as teachers uh, in, in that school up on the hill, but uh, also as neighbors and friends and congregants. I have admired their dedication to teaching and I know that it's not always easy. Um, this policy, uh, uh, policy 6450 gives uh, them some support in that and I am glad to be here this evening to say a few word a few words in support of it I applaud the the focus of this policy uh, revision um, the the focus that it gives to educating the student I think it provides an opportunity for students not only to gain knowledge but to practice the skills necessary to evaluate and use that knowledge. We're a pluralistic society, and because of that, it's important for students to know something about differing viewpoints and to be able to talk about them and to make informed decisions. Policy 6450 provides a responsible approach to including controversial topics in the classroom both in planned ways as part of the curriculum and in those unplanned teachable moments that come up uh, just in the course of, uh, of interaction and uh, conversations about whatever may be happening in students' lives that day. It also provides for giving parents information and the chance to choose alternate activities when they the, uh, con this, the discussion of controversial topics is planned in advance. 
I want to thank the policy subcommittee for your good work and um, urge you as a board to uh, adopt this policy as it's presented. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board at this time? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Lenny and then Don. Move approval of the consent agenda. Don. I'm sorry, I wanted to pull something up. Nope. With the exception of the item that Don. Do you want a second pull. it and then pull it? Uh, I would. Or do you want to do it the other way around? Is that appropriate to second it and then pull something? Can they do it? We'll make it way? easier. I withdraw my motion. All right, there's yep. no motion on the table. I'd like to uh, pull contract seven. Uh, I believe it's listed as number 8582 uh, for discussion. Lanny? Move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of the pulled item. That's contract number seven. Mm -hmm. Professional learning management system. Thank you. All right, is there a second on that motion? Barbara? I accept the It's been moved and seconded to adopt the consent agenda with the exception of contract number seven, professional management systems, and it will be discussed later in the agenda. Laura, would you please call the roll? Ms. Meyer. Yes. Mr. Boswell. Yes. Mrs. Duncan. Yes. Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Ms. Mungard. Yes. Mrs. Danik. Yes. Moving on, we have items for first reading from board committees. It's the 2016-17 transportation plan. As Bill McCoy comes up to review the transportation plan and give you some fun stats and statistics over the last year, I would like to highlight his career. We have a great transition plan in place, so he'll be with the school district for a number of months ahead of us yet. Um, but one of the neat statistics we found in highlighting his career is he's been responsible for over 15 miles of transportation of students. And that's 30 round trips to the moon and back. And so um, <laughs> he's held in very high regard in my eyes and many eyes across the school district. He's gonna present the transportation plan for 1617. He will be alongside our new director starting the school year beginning here in June, and then we'll stay into the fall months to help make sure we get everything passed off accordingly. But his 38, 39 years of service is very respected. And um, we have lots of celebrating to come and lots of transition to come, but this will be his last transportation plan for all of you. Well, thank you, Dr. Standish. I would just say I've had more fun and more opportunities than anybody should be allowed to have. Um, <laughs> Um, as we do each spring, uh, we prepare a transportation plan for the following school year. So what you have before you this evening uh, is uh, the totality of our work so far and putting that plan together. Um, our transportation staff over the course of the last couple of months has worked with various departments and schools uh, to solicit feedback uh, regarding our needs for next school year. Um, and so you essentially you have two attachments uh, to the board agenda this evening on this particular item. Uh, attachment number one, uh, which represents the total uh, number of bus runs that we're proposing for this coming uh, school year for 1617. And then uh, attachment number two, uh, which is the financial impact of uh, specific changes that we're recommending. Um, as Dr. Standish alluded to, I'll, I'll give you a few fun facts. Um, um, just to give a little perspective, um, in the 14-15 school year, our um, LPS drivers logged 1,098,524 miles, which um, is pretty consistent with what we've done in the last few years. We anticipate that number is going to grow a little bit this year just because of some of the additional things that we're doing, uh, such as the Career Academy, for example. Uh, also in the 14-15 school year, we logged 109,031 miles specifically for activity trips. Uh, that is another component of service that we provide. Uh, in 14-15, uh, we actually uh, drove 2,966 activity trip athletic trips. And so far this year, we've logged uh, just at 3,700 uh, trips uh, for the current school year. Of all the trips that we've done, 77% of those have been, have been done in-house by LPS drivers. Uh, we do have a small percentage of field trips that we do using contracted services. Um, all of our buses in the fleet are subject to 80-day inspections. You may have heard me speak to that before. Uh, presently, we have 135 bus drivers, uh, including sub-drivers and 92 paraeducators. 
Uh, we currently have 111 bus routes that we uh, provide service to on a daily basis. Uh, each route consists on average of four to five individual runs, uh, which make up the individual's work day. Uh, we continue to seek additional bus drivers. That's been one of our initiatives uh, that we've been working on very hard, and many recruitment efforts are underway. Um, uh, in fact, just earlier this month, we had a couple of radio spots run on a couple of our local radio stations to help us in that effort. Um, uh, to date, since July 1st, we've, uh, we've licensed 33 drivers, uh, which is a large number, but we still need more to meet the, uh, the demand. And I will say that part of our 1617 plan will include a component of contracting. Uh, we, we feel that even though we've been making efforts uh, to hire more drivers, uh, we still need to rely upon contracting to help us get through uh, the process. So uh, we will have a component of contracting included uh, in next school year. So as I alluded to, attachment one is a, a representation, uh, a working draft, you might say, of all of the runs that we're anticipating providing service for uh, for the 16-17 school year. And so uh, really what our transportation staff is doing now is taking the composite of all of those runs and putting together route driving packages. And as I had alluded to earlier, um, essentially what, you, uh, what we attempt to do here is we try to maximize use of both resources, both equipment and drivers. And so we'll take and uh, work to, uh, very diligently the rest of the spring uh, to put together these packages. And these will be the actual driving assignments that our drivers will engage in this coming school year. Um, attachment two um, represents the, uh, the uh, specific impact of changes that we're proposing for this upcoming school year. And I'd like to just briefly talk about those. Um, the first one uh, that's listed at the top is uh, Adams Elementary School. We are proposing to add one bus route to Adams Elementary for this coming school year. Currently, the school is served by two buses uh, that provide transport of students to and from school. Um, um, we feel that we need to add a third bus to balance out ride times uh, for that area of the city. That's been kind of a growing concern for us uh, that we, uh, as we have students added to those routes, because many of these um, students live on acreages and they're typically spread out over a distance. Uh, when you add a child to a route, it impacts the uh, ride times of all the other students pretty significantly. So we do need to add that third bus, we feel, uh, to help balance out those times. Uh, the impact of that, uh, we're projecting to be $18,440. Uh, we're also proposing to uh, implement transportation for the uh, focus programs. Um, uh, that would be for the arts and humanities and the science focus program. And essentially what we're proposing there uh, would be a, um, something similar to what we did with the Career Academy, which would be kind of a, a northern and southern corridor uh, transportation service. Uh, the bus would stop at each of the high schools in the morning and the afternoon, picking up any of those students that might be interested in participating in the, in the focus program. Um, so we essentially have a link with all of the schools on the north and the south side of the town providing service in to and from the focus programs. Um, and uh, we're anticipating the financial impact of that to be at $34,640. And then uh, with the opening of Wysong Elementary School uh, this coming school year, we are anticipating to uh, have a need to add a special education route uh, for Wysong. And uh, we're anticipating that impact to be $33,070. Uh, so for a total net uh, impact of the general fund of $86,150. In addition to that, we do have the um, IAQ project at Human Elementary School. Uh, as you know, they're going to be relocating to a temporary site uh, this coming school year. So we will need to be providing transportation for all of those students uh, to and from their relocation site. Uh, we're anticipating right now that to be six buses uh, to provide that service. And uh, we're, in, we're uh, in uh, anticipating financial impact of $108,186 uh, for that, uh, which uh, those funds would be coming from the building fund, uh, which I believe those are already existing in the budget. So again, the general fund impact would be 86150 and then the building fund would be 108186 so uh, with that, I would just say that um, our transportation staff just continues to diligently work. Uh, you hear me say a lot, the first and last classroom of the day. Um, our staff really pride themselves in being able to be an extension of the classroom. 
Uh, we have a lot of dedicated staff that work very hard every day. They enjoy working with kids. They enjoy the opportunity uh, to have an impact in their lives. So uh, with that, that would include my comments, and I would try to answer any questions you might have. Questions? Barbara. Um, thank you for a very thorough report. I just wanted to go and highlight the fact that we're now going and providing transportation to the arts and humanities and science-focused programs, something that we've hoped to, as a board, I think, do for a very long time. And I want to thank you, Bill, and your staff for making that possible. And I just want to encourage um, anyone who may be watching or listening um, to uh, look at those focus programs, perhaps uh, it would be an opportunity for your student now since uh, transportation.